whenever somebody gets on something to do with either the secret chiefs of the Third Order, the Sin of Masters, or the Black Lodge, which doesn't have an office with a sign, Black Lodge, you know, that's just, you're not getting right. what they are. I think if you have a loud enough public face, you will get flat. That's what I told my publisher before we did the book. So fair, you know, forearmed is forearmed. Still caused him, and I assume, I haven't heard the broadcast you did with him, but I assume he mentioned some of his woes. It was dreadful for him. Is it about the Black Lodge still? Because I think that's the only barrier your current publisher might have. He, he told me, I think he said like a prayer or something. Like, he said, if anybody is out there from the Black Lodge, no, I promise it, this will be the latest. Last I've, thing I read. I've told any number of people, I had always intended the Secret Cipher to be a trilogy. I'd gotten a lot of flack on the original book mostly from the head poobah, the OTO. So the second book was 10 years before it came out. And I was no longer caring what the grand poobah, the OTO, would say. There are some people who did far too much acid in the 60s, what can I say? Not referring to any litigious person that I might be referring to. Yeah, you're not talking about anybody specific. A lot of people... So of, many people, a lot yeah. of people say, people are saying. People yeah, are that, saying. That's, that's what I hear people are saying. And you have They're to saying. go by what people say. That's right. Outer space, disclosure any minute. Yeah, right. Where was I before I got off on Atari? After the Black Lunch. Okay, so... It was another 15 years before the Black Lodge book. Why was it on the Black Lodge? I had originally intended it to be on the secret sheets of the Third Order, which is the positive reflex of the Black Lodge, as sort of depicted by the initiated wisdom of Twin Peaks. That's why the word real is in there to distinguish it from Twin Peaks, but when you take it all in, clearly Lynch and company have a level of illumination that they were displaying in fictional form, because I have not in modern times heard anybody else talking about the Black Lodge and the White Lodge. Well, the secret chiefs of the third Order are the beings of light. And that was what the book was intended to be. But as times got dark, I decided it was time for an uh, intellectual antiseptic. And that's why the book is on, centered on the Black Lodge. How it will be displayed, but yes, one of the things that got left out of the Black Lodge book were the people who have been martyrs in the pursuit of knowledge. There is a long list. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, 
gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And whether that is about the Black Lodge, or is about people who, like Icarus, flew too high, I will leave to the readers. There are a lot of other areas as well. And that's what the book will be about. What it'll be titled, I don't know. And whether I can sell it to Olive, I don't know. I'll try. I'll say, look, let me write it. What it could be the, martyr, the Martyrs of the Black Lodge or the Black Lodge's Martyrs. I don't know. Although that implies that they have martyrs, so I don't... You know, it could go either way. No, it's not going to be that. It would be Martyrs of the Great White Brother. Yeah. But I, yeah. I would have to change that because that sounds too much like the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, it sounds like Martyrs of the Aryan Brotherhood, which <laughs> kind of doesn't really have the right... No, I don't <laughs> doesn't have quite not, the right... <laughs> no, no, no. That's why I prefer Secret Chiefs or the Ascended Masters, which is what the Theosophists call them now. But, of course, they use the term Great White Brotherhood, too because the founders there were a bit on the racist side. But, you know, you go back in history, it's very difficult to find people who were not racially insensitive at best. Right. Right, it's like Lovecraft, right? He was, just a, he was a man of his era, right? And it just is, it is what it is, unfortunately. He modeled Cthulhu who on the Jews on the subway during his brief tenure in New York, or so I hear from. Well, that's the other weird thing too, because he married a Jewish woman, so that that was a that man was and divorced. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there was a horror. At Red Hook was also like he was this terror at Russian Russian immigrants or immigrants. There, yeah, there's a lot of his cat. His cat's name, which I won't repeat. That was a little on the nose. Anyway, I, you like science fiction, too. I know you kind of in that category, so. Yeah, when I was mentioning, I think it was before yeah. the program, my influences, the same time I joined the Mystic Art Book Society and NICAP, I also joined the Science Fiction Book Club and became deeply enamored of the work of Philip K. Dick, which I still am. I mean, there's nothing new coming out, although that would be very Philip K. Dick. But, yeah. uh, if, someone wants to, if someone wants to do some automatic writing, maybe there is. But Well, there is the missing head of Philip K. Dick, which a group of AI enthusiasts built a head of Philip K. Dick, kind of an animatronic thing, which would have pleased Phil, I think and put it together with an AI body and some computer gizmos that I don't understand, but that was interactive, sort of like replica, mm. only less sexy maybe, and took it to a convention. And indeed, since they had programmed in every word he had ever published, and probably some unpublished stuff, which I've seen, the unpublished stuff needs to get out there. It's nonfiction very interesting. Anyway, people would ask the head questions, and it would give pretty sensible answers. And in his voice, or in whatever they call those tracks now, sounding like his voice. And I, it was very successful. I didn't hear any criticism of it. And the guy who invented it took it with him on the plane and forgot it and left it on the plane. And it has never been seen since. So That's somewhere very... in this shining land, the sun is shining bright. But there's no a very, joy in AI. That's a very, that's a very Philip K. Dick story. Yes, uh, you ever... and it's the truth. Somebody wrote a yeah. book, Bring Me the Head of Philip K. Dick, which I think is both amusing. Did you ever get a chance to meet him, by the way? No, I've met a lot of science fiction writers. I must say, he was the only one who was on my A-list that I never met. And having read a lot from the 
people he was closest to. Kind of glad I didn't meet him because he lived up to his last name, apparently, in person. He drank a lot. He did a lot of speed, which killed him. And he had an irascible personality. And I'm a Scorpio. And the twin. Yeah, please. And but besides yeah. all of my science fiction heroes that I met, I didn't like them afterwards. It didn't sour their books on me. Right. But the best I could do is they must put all their best stuff into their books because they're assholes. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email through a glass darkly ads at gmail.com. Yeah, I think I think Harlan Ellison kind of I don't know if it's Harlan Ellison who said it, but he was speaking of speaking of what you said. But he would say he's gonna get you say a lot of wise things. I think you said you have to like be a good writer is on time, good, and friendly. Pick two. So if you are a talented writer and you get everything in on time, you can be as much of an asshole as you want to be. Well, Harlan would certainly know about assholes. He's a trip. I never met him, but he's he was a trip. But Philip K. Dick, there was. Are you familiar with Tim Powers? I'm familiar with his work. Yeah. So they were close. Yeah. That was towards the latter part of. I mean, I've read a lot of biographical stuff by Jeter and Powers and other people who would sit around for hours on end getting drunk with PKD. And I don't know, maybe it's me, but I literally have read every book that he wrote, including the, the unpublished fiction. A lot of the short stories, not all of them, okay. because there is a collection of all of them, but I can't afford it. Although... Christmas is coming sometime. How, what, is it out of print or something? Why is it so expensive? Because it's out of print and because oh, okay. it was from a small press. It had one edition, and I guess people in general don't want to see his musings to other people. I did manage after a long time to purchase a used copy of... The Dark-Haired Woman, which if you can find it, I recommend it. And it's full of references to the Men in Black and his own. And it's just a series of letters. There's one short story in it, previously unpublished, but it's a series of letters. He was, is inveterate the right term? A very frequent letter writer back in the days of typewritten letters. And these are some of his best letters to some of his best correspondents. I believe they date from the period in the early 70s before the young Turks of science fiction ever encountered him. I mean, there's like before Vancouver, after Vancouver, before Berkeley, after Berkeley. And I guess they knew basically the Orange County filled it. And the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is none of the biographies that I have seen, including by, shall we say, ex-wives. He kind of didn't have a stable hand for the ladies. He, well, don't go by what they say. I have well, I, as in he would attract, four exes, so to like crazy ladies. As in he would, he was like attracted to crazy, like literal ladies in asylums at times. Yes, and yeah. also quite young. And that has an attraction and it has a drawback. But I would never want to assess his attitude towards women based on what his exes say. Because right. I can see it now. Sometime after I have shuffled off this mortal coil, any one of my exes, particularly number three, describing what I was like, and I don't think it would be a reflection of who I am or what I was, and the same would be true of him.
It's just not the case. But none of his biographies really get him. They have him pegged as a crazy but brilliant guy. That's mm -hmm. true. But does that mean that the things that he said were unimportant outside of the fictional context? No, I think he was way, way ahead of, well, his field. And his non-science fiction writings, which all but one case never got published in his lifetime, they're as good as Jack Kerouac in describing what life in middle class America, lower middle class America, was like in the 1950s. So if you honor Jack Kerouac and friends, then maybe you ought to put Phil Dick in the same category. All right, back to the Black Lodge. Sorry for that derailment, but I figured it was a good thread to tug on a little bit. Ah, uh, Black Lodge probably interfered with Phil Dick's life. How's that for a segue? And speaking back of the Black Law, were we? Okay, I think that whenever somebody gets on something to do with either the Secret Chiefs of the Third Order, Ascended Masters, or the Black Lodge, which doesn't have an office with a sign, Black Lodge, you know, that's just, you're not getting right. what they are. I think if you have a loud enough public face, you will get flack. That's what I told my publisher before we did the book. So fair, you know, forearmed is forearmed. Still caused him, and I assume, I haven't heard the broadcast you did with him, but I assume he mentioned some of his woes. It was dreadful for him, and I would not uh, fault him for not doing another book on that subject. But it certainly, so far, thank God, has not been as bad as it was for uh, Ron Bonds at Illuminate Press. So read the book while it's still around. Uh, how's that? Yeah. But why it hasn't come for me, well, it did, in a way. Long story, I should pause and eat up my tea. But. Yeah, get the voice nice and limber. Me, 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 me. Oh, soul, no, me. Don't get me on that, no. You'll just have to put up with the voice. And now, a moment of silence. Okay, so back in my OTO days, you may sell, spell that. It was a Freudian slip. D-A-Y-S or D-A-Z-E, I think the latter. And it works well as a double entendre. Yes, it does, and it should. Anyway, the lodge in Atlanta then known as Ulysses Lodge Number 10, OTO Incorporated. It was the only separate corporation that existed. We were invited to the annual spiral gathering at Hard Labor Creek State Park, somewhere in rural Georgia, where I don't remember. So they wanted us to do a Gnostic Mass, which we happened to be very, very good at. Mm -hmm. The lodge master at that time, Bill, with one L, was a great priest. I was a great deacon. And I guess a young lady named Jana was a great priestess. Or ex-wife number two of mine was a great priestess also. And she's had various names, and for various reasons we won't go there. Well, here's our dilemma. We're followers of Crowley's admonitions about the Gnostic Mass. Mm -hmm. It says, no one should be present who is not going to take communion. So we thought, how are we going to do that? There will be 300 people there. So what we decided to do 
in those days there were no inspectors so nobody ever watched what we did from the hierarchy which was in my opinion a better organization because it was sort of a cappella locally we decided to do a demonstration celebratory mass where no one except our own participants in the mass would be there and announce in advance if you like this we're going to do a closed mass following the book which you will be required to take communion if you participate in and that's the subtext of why we were there they had these reminded me of boy scouts actually they had these structures which had a bunch of beds in them so our whole lodge was bedded down in this well everybody that came in this particular structure and we were there for the whole event which was three or four days I forget which anyway fast backwards to about two months before this dead ringer I mean dead ringer for Charles Manson as he looked then shows up at a rather important a party our parties were probably more important than the rituals at Ulysses Lodge and since in those days it was open house for things like that the then lodge mistress from New Orleans was there and we were laying out the red carpet for her and this Charles Manson look-alike shows up and I don't know I'm bad at public events because I'm agoraphobic so I was sitting over in the corner but I'm observing and I see this guy flitting from person to person and I thought well I'm going to tune in and see what he's talking about and he kept talking about the then near future harmonic convergence that was like the 20th century one of many versions of the 2012 Mayan calendar fiasco mm -hmm. it's coming Y2K didn't work but if you wait around for 2012 the world will end we're sure of it to which I said at the time look the guy that was carving the calendar probably got tired of carving and just left so don't take it it's too bad it ends in 2012 which it turned it didn't turn out to be anyway so he's preaching doom and gloom and I thought I got to do something so I started at a distance following Charlie around and as he's going to leave I thought I would get in a blow for the secret chiefs so I go to the back door of the lodge where they had no kidding him and his gang had a hippie van with the designs on it this is probably before your time but it was out of place in time even mm -hmm. at this point but I, like one of those Volkswagen kind of like yep rounded yep. sort of orange yep. Oh, I, I, that's flowers, the image that I can, I, I immediately saw in my head. Anyway. Spray paint, flowers, peace sign, love power. The same thing that Manson himself would have had in order to attract the dumb fools that he was able to mesmerize. Anyway, I figured this guy was about the same stuff, but he'd come to the wrong house because we really were tight group so I go to the door and I thought I'll mojo juju this guy so I said as he's got one foot in the van he was going to drive I said you know I think this harmonic convergence thing is going to be really important but not for you Important for you will be January 16th, 1997. And that's going to be a really, really difficult day for you. And I saw his mask dissolve. And for one moment, there was fear on his face. 
because he thought I was, as I was, implying that he was going to die on whatever date I made up at the time. Right. I can spin a good yarn, as many people say. So I thought, there's one for the Gipper. So I'm at this couple of months, fast forward now, to the event where the whole lodge is there. And I see that at this event, there is that guy. And I thought, WTF, he doing here. I thought I was done and had chased him. Probably his ghouls, I mean his associates are here too, but I didn't really notice them because they were in the back of the van and didn't get out at the lodge. So I didn't say anything to anybody. There was a rival OTO body, President Bill Siebert's group from upstate New York, which actually, in retrospect, I have more respect for than I do the OTO Corporation. They had been affiliated with Kenneth Grant, and Grant, typical of Grant, had apparently demitted them or expelled them, whatever Grant did. It was a sort of common thing, both for Crowley and for Grant. So we had that little drama going. But everybody got together in this big hall, the same place we did the mass in, for meals, which were provided. And I guess we were on the freebie list because we had done some outreach to the local Atlanta neo-pagan community, and they in turn had given us a lot more respect than we probably deserved. So I guess it was the second day there we were having lunch, and I see Manson Jr. walk in. I'm not going to say junior because he had that fierceness about him as well. People who saw the eyes would be standoffish. Apparently a lot of people didn't. And I guess it was some of his people there because they banged a gong or something to get everybody's attention. And he said, I want to announce that if everybody will put a dollar in, I will give them a piece of paper, whatever, and we will put it in a fishbowl and draw out at random one person who will tomorrow morning at breakfast have a naked slave come to their bed and give them their breakfast. And I thought, Everybody will put a dollar in. And to add insult to injury, he said, the money will go to a cleanup campaign for Arabia Mountain. Now, at that point, for 20-some-odd years, Arabia Mountain, an obscure place that hardly anybody in the greater Atlanta area even knew existed, even people that lived in the town, Conyers, Georgia, next to it, mostly didn't know because it was a bald monotonic and a couple of trees, but mostly long since the silt had gone down. So there was a line of trees that masked it off. I mean, there were, you know, people who went there because when I discovered it, I was in the sixth grade and we went there on a field trip. That was about the extent of people knowing about it because they were unique flora and fauna there. There's also in those days a lot of graffiti. There was a Jesus Saves and then there was later some neo-pagan stuff. And I was very impressed and went back there first with the Castaneda group in, beginning in the early 1980s and then for the Great Arabia working beginning I guess in the mid-1990s and continuing to maybe four years ago. We did 10 years, and I empowered many people free for nothing. And I felt like we were getting a lot of repeaters, and a lot of people were taking it to be some kind of religious ceremony or whatever. So I decided, well, 
we're done. Everybody who's going to get anything. And they came from all over. It even had a couple of people from Scandinavia and Britain and California, which is almost as far away. So I considered it a successful work. And this guy is saying, we're going to do a cleanup of Arabia Mountain. And I immediately thought, clean up. What are the various things one can infer from this? He's threatening me. And am I being paranoid? I'll know because maybe a hundred people put their dollar in. The fishbowl was filled up. He's going to pull my name out for the naked slave breakfast. And I will know that this is all done for my benefit or for my warning. Sure enough, I don't remember when it was, probably that same night at dinner, with great fanfare and beating of gong, he pulls out and he said, Alan Greenfield is the winner. Everybody clapping except me. I should have brought my gun and probably a couple of katanas too. Well, what can he do? All of the members of the lodge will be there. Well, it turns out that a young lady from Bill Siebert's lodge, who I had frankly been making time with the night before, turns up naked with breakfast. Well, <clears throat> this is a long story, but because wife number two was one of the people who was there, she had been the priestess, and I thought, maybe this is the deal. It's to embarrass me. So I said to the naked girl, naked slave, I don't eat breakfast, which is true. Why don't you give it to my lodge brothers and sisters? And I thought, ha once again, I foiled his game. And I guess I went back to sleep. Later in the day, I thought they probably left. And I went to lunch. And when I'm just outside the building where everybody's meeting, there stands the guy, Nansen, on the steps so that I have to go by him in order to get lunch. And I thought, is lunch worth it? Well, hell, I don't eat breakfast. I'd best <laughs> take the bull by the horns. And reflexively, I figure I'm just going to dodge him. He puts out his hand. And because, among other things, I am a southern gentleman, if you put out your hand, unless I'm going to duel with you, in which case I slap you on the face and I say, meet me in the morning with your seconds, I shake it. And as I shake his hand, I notice he's got a ring on, and the ring has a Lucretia Borgia thing, a uh, prick in it. And I feel it go into my hand, and I thought, I'm dead. I don't know how long it'll be, a day, an hour, probably while I'm at lunch. But he has killed me, and I've been a fool, so I deserve to die. I don't know what happened to him after that. I was busy, you know, writing my own eulogy and talking to God quite a great deal. You know, can I get a reprieve, for the, you know, into the well, 2030s maybe? I, I promised to be a good boy and nothing happened. Days, weeks, months, I share with my lodge brothers and sisters what's going on just in case I croak later, you know, nothing happens. And I realized at some point, this was after the bloodbath at uh, the Luminette Press, it was inert, but it was to tell me, we can get you anytime we want. So be careful what you say. Be careful what you do, because we're everywhere. And that, my friend, 
is the only time I have ever had contact directly with the Black Lodge. I'm not saying he was in the Black Lodge, but he was. Yeah, it could have been a tool. Right. A tool, a yes. Yes, the, the Black Lodge is not made up of present-day human beings. It's made up of discarnate former humans who choose to remain powerful rather than to give up their power and go on to higher levels as the members of the Great White Brotherhood or secret chiefs or whatever you want to call them do. Instead, they want to keep everybody down. They can't do that. They want to kill them. And I was chastened for about a month. And then uh, an agent of the secret chiefs, who was unabashedly such, the eventual outer head of the order QBLH, puts into my hands the lexicon program, which was my break to get involved in the secret cipher of the euphemons. And I may be skewing the times all somewhat, but we're dealing in the period circa 1985 to 1995 or 96. And all of these events happen with zero Exaggeration. I mean, I love to tell a story and add things. You know, he descended from the saucer <laughs> and wanted to shake it, but this is the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I have rarely been afraid in my life. I am not a particularly fearful person, but I was afraid that day. I was quite sure I was going to suffer a really awful fate for the sin of having told him the date of his death, which, well, by the way, whatever that date was, because I didn't remember, because I pulled it out of my derriere, I thought, I do remember it was 19-something. So when the 21st century came around, I wasn't worried about Y2K. I was celebrating, man. After midnight, yeah, I don't care. Let all the computers die. I'm alive! It's alive. And... I hope that story is as meaningful to you as it is to me. Here's a random question, because I just noticed this today when I was reading your book. So in your book, you mentioned that AWAS, according to Crowley, communicated to Crowley, I think, to start writing the Book of the Law on April 8th, 1904. Right? Right. That's the story. So well, just take the date, but may, yeah, that's the story. On April 8th, 2024, there's going to be a, a solar eclipse in the U.S. That would mark 120 years from that date. Does that mean anything, or is that just... Only if you think the date is correct. I sort of inherited all of the unpublished late writings of his magical child, Frater Akkad. I mm -hmm. thought I would do something with that, but I really, actually, Olaf has all that stuff now. Somebody else will, it's a massive thing. And one of his letters to one of his associates, I forget which one, but somebody probably in one of the groups that he formed late in life, he said, well, Crowley told me it was all channeled on April 1st. And I thought, aha. And then I thought, well, Crowley knew what April 1st is also. Was that his way of saying, I'm not really sure when I did it, but I've got a story now. Mm -hmm. Because on the cover, which you rarely see, of the original manuscript of Libra de Legis, or as I like to call it, liberal, Liberal. Crowley has this interesting thing about automatic writing 
This is a good example of automatic writing. And that's dated two or three years later. So there are layers. It's two or three years after that that he discovers that this is his life's work. And all of that may be true. I think I was is a real secret chief. Probably still because they are discarnate and outside of time. I think some of his later communications with Lamb and so forth are also secret chiefs, which is why Lamb looks so much like a gray right. alien, which is something in my OTO days, double entendre, I got a lot of flack on after Secret Cipher came out. I said, in a long, long footnote aimed only at one person, the Grand Poobah, I said, the entire structure of the Crowley mythos is based on a communication with a praetor human intelligence calling itself I was. If you discount that that intelligence is praetor human or ultra terrestrial or whatever terminology you want to use, you have read yourself out of the will. So I would be very careful to discount the gray alien lamb connection or amelantra or anything that influenced Crowley in 1904 or later. Now the fact is, my father was born in March of 1904 at the beginning of what Crowley called the Cairo working because he was in Cairo when right. he wrote this stuff down. And that much is probably true. My father died on April 10th, 1971. The date of the third chapter of the Book of the Law. The one that basically is about death. If you take it to be a series of Masonic degrees, it's birth, life, and death, among many other interpretations. So I take the text less seriously than the Thelemites do. I take it as Crowley at his best with some slippage into the these and thous of his Plymouth Brethren youth, but essentially as one of many channel communications starting in the early 1800s with Joseph Smith, pardon me, LDS, and continuing through a Hospi and the Urantia book, and also the Book of the Law, and also Patience Worth, and also the raw material that in modern times. And it's just... Uh, yeah, I definitely need to ask you about that. I, I, we, we've, gone, we've gone, I think, way over, so I just want to ask you one or two... I still have some voice left. I love a parade. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so you mentioned the raw material. So, Andrej Puharovic. Does that name ring a bell at all? Of course. Uh, Andrej Puharovic. Puharovic, yeah. thank you. Yeah, he was a uh, doctor of medicine, very famous for a lot of things, including inventions, which was something that the skeptics like to point out because he was enamored of Uri Geller and he said, oh, probably Poharich fashioned some device that even in a shielded room, which they did it at oh, RI. Oh, now why am I? A Faraday cage. Faraday cage, yeah. Could get word to Geller, not how, how did Poharich know what the picture that they were looking at. I mean, it was, it's just a very lame thing. I think Geller is a showman, much like Crowley, mm -hmm. but also a guy, because I've seen him work. He's both. 
Right. Yeah, both. And my five years at the Psychic Friends Network taught me, because we were, unlike those other networks, we were for real. We were highly tested before we... But there is no way you can be psychic on demand. Not unless you're a prophet or, you know, whatever. It just doesn't work that way. And so you have to use psychology and do cold readings and all. And he does. And I've seen him bend a spoon just like this. Oh, look, it's going to bend. With Shippy Strang standing behind him. Look, it bent. And everybody other than me is going, oh, oh. And I thought, what did Barnum say? There's a sucker born every minute. But I've also seen him do amazing things under control conditions that cannot possibly be something that the amazing Randy, who I knew well, could duplicate, although he could claim it. He certainly claimed it with a Ted Serios material, and I caught Randy, a very good stage magician, on the second try with his explanation. And that had been monitored by dozens of with Sirius, and he just stopped doing it. He stopped being able to do it. But Randy, we were in Gene Steinberg's room at one of the UFO conventions, and Randy wanted to show this off because he was going on the Today Show the next morning and wanted to test it out on a couple of rubes. Well, he didn't consider me a rube, but he probably considered Gene a rube, and I'm sorry, Gene, you weren't so... He does it once, and I thought, he's palming something. But I'll have to see. I said, do it again, Randy, because Gene was, wow, I guess that means, you know, whatever. I'm not being fair. I have no idea what Gene said. <laughs> but I'll make it up as he goes along. So Randy did it again, and I said, so you palm one of those little things that you look through that says, girls in Florida, right? You used to find those at roadside attractions just this little plastic thing, and it had a picture in it. If you held it up to the light, I said. And I thought, well, this is not going to work. And the next morning, I watched the Today Show. And guess what the amazing Randy did? He said, I've reached a conclusion about this case. Let me walk up to the camera. He walked up to the camera and lit the thing. It has a little squeeze light in it. And you could see the scantily clad girl on the beach just within the limits of NBC. And I thought, son of a bitch. He knows that this isn't what Sirius does, but he's willing to take Geller and Sirius and anybody else who claims any phenomena. He's willing to trash their lives in order to be able to do something after his escape artist days were really over. So. Council of Nine. Who are they? What are they? How are they related to Pumarich, if at all? The raw material? The raw material was done by some very close friends of mine in Kentucky. They had the redeeming value that at least when Carla Rukert was kind of the mover and shaker there, and Don Elkins was the channel for the raw material, which was amusing to me because he was an Eastern Airlines pilot by day and a channeler by night. They did their shticklock, their thing, in my living room for me. Very impressive. But Carla always said, as far as I know, we don't claim any particular thing for this material. We claim that it is of interest to us and perhaps of interest to others. And I thought, what a breath of fresh air. Not only that, that is validating. Not only that, but they claimed that they could teach anyone the technique that they use for channel. And I never heard anybody say, they took my money and ran, or 
they gave me the mail order course and how to channel or whatever. They were like night and day with people who start a religion or publish a very lucrative book or whatever. And both Carla and Don have long since gone on to that great eastern airline in the sky, which is also gone. Yeah, yeah, eastern airlines is gone, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah I did a channel reading myself for two stewardesses as they were then for eastern. And they said, so, because it was when the rumors were starting that eastern was going south. And I don't mean to Delta territory. I mean, they were going south. I said, well, let me put it this way. Do you have other job prospects? Because <laughs> it was just this. It's history. It will be history. So I was gentle. They were paying me. So you have to be caring. But I also, you know, call them as I see them. Yeah, it's better to be honest and upset Well, it's somebody. better to be honest in a situation like that. I mean, when I was with Psychic Friends, I had a couple people who had, this is during the really bad times, people who had just discovered they were HIV positive. Oh, man. And they wanted me to, I don't know, they'd already been diagnosed, I guess. They wanted to know if they had a future. And the impression I had was they did not. But I was not going to say that to them. So I made something up. And in fact, what I made up turned out to be correct. If they survived a few more years, there were medications in the pipelines that were coming, but they needed to keep a positive attitude. But I lied through my teeth because what was I supposed to do with them? Most people called about romance and finance, and I could just be a straight shooter with them. Or what is my dog thinking? which I didn't feel the need to be a straight shooter with that. Uh, <laughs> I well, felt like I'm not going to call you a dumbass, so that's worth the three ninety nine a minute that I don't get. We did a quarter a minute, or when I got promoted, 35 cents a talk a minute. They were odds makers, and they went out of business when the IRS jumped on them and said, these people that work for you are not independent contractors. They are employees. They have to sign in and sign out. They mm. get a check. They are employees. So they gave us a W-2 for one year and went out of business. I kind of saw that coming, not from psychic point of view, but from... Yeah, just so, a business point of view, right? Yeah, like, from a yeah. business... Yeah, they, yeah, the whole business is probably based on we pay a quarter and we get this profit, and then everything else is overhead that we have to pay for. The moment what, you they, it, you know. what they used to do, and may still do, I don't know if they're still around, they were, before Psychic Friends, they were odds makers for horse races and dog races and various Keno and you know other mafia stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, you saying they're mobbed up? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not saying that because whereas I'm not real worried about the Black Lodge, yeah, it is yeah, true yeah. that on occasion about. they will employ someone from the underworld, and I don't mean the shaver underworld, I mean the other underworld to, uh, to eliminate a problem. And I keep a katana next to my door because I don't want to shoot my neighbor by accident. And if you behead, you know, the three men in black, they probably will be the only thing you'll behead. And then you'll have to explain to the landlord as he escorts you to the police car. <laughs> but I was just defending my home. Okay. Well, you are in Georgia, so you might be a little bit better off than what I, oh, where yeah. I would be in California. It's, but. it's concealed carry, as far as I know, legal in Georgia. And I don't think any kind of knife... I don't know about swords, but any kind of knife is requires any kind of permit. That's just yeah. recently under the present governor, but yeah. Well, that's, yeah, in Britain, 
you can't even have like kitchen well i don't know i don't know if to, i just know there's some weird knife like thing. yeah that's true in california you can't have knives beyond a certain length really yeah oops i think it's seven inches something like it's a good size what knife. carrying or in your house oh carrying oh, okay yeah, no, no. in your house I'm pretty sure, except maybe in New York and Massachusetts, I'm pretty sure you can own a firearm in most. Yeah, yeah you can. You can. And can it's you use just, it if somebody comes through the window, you know, carrying a shotgun and saying, give me all your money. You say, I keep my money in the drawer by the bed, okay? I gave my money to Gavin Newsom. I'm sorry, but it's, <laughs> it's gone. I can't have it again. Well, who's he? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Any final words for the audience uh, other than buy both books immediately on Amazon, clicking at the link below? Well, my present publisher has been good enough to, with maybe two exceptions, one that I wanted to be an exception, the other I don't know why, keeping all of my books in print. And... So even books that were long out of print and went to, I don't know, three digits used book sales, which by the way, I don't get anything from, are now in print for, you know, the same price as any other book on the market. So the story of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light is in print, and my history of ufology in the 70s forget what name, there are a lot of books, and Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, Secret Rituals of the Men in Black, the complete Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, which has both of those, and Secrets of the Real Black Lodge Revealed are all in print, plus several that I'm not thinking of. So, as I said, you can go to Amazon, or Barnes & Noble, or most of the brick and mortar, they have to order it maybe, depending on which one. But the online, most people buy their books online now, I think. And I'd also be tempted to say sadly, because bookstores are really hurting. But you can get them all, and I would appreciate it. And probably after you read them, you would appreciate it too. At least I hope so. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. It was a journey, and I hope the audience enjoys it, because it, it definitely will. So. Can I sing? It was great fun, but it was just one of those things. Eat your heart out, Sinatra. Thank you, Alan. Talk soon. Okay. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe. And also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel, and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon and just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you can get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link, 
the channel gets a cut of that and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.